Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the DVOS Morningstar uh, webinar on digital infrastructure uh, in the AI era, um, our initial credit thoughts um, on its impact. Um, let's give everyone another 30 seconds or so, and then we will get started. Okay, um, I think that we can actually get started. So once again, uh, thank you everyone and welcome to the DBRS Morningstar webinar uh, on digital infrastructure um, in the AI era uh, and its credit impacts. Um, my name is Victor Liang. Uh, I work in the Project Finance and Infrastructure Group. Um, the Project Finance and Infrastructure Group uh, at DBRS Morningstar covers all sorts of sectors which can fit into a project finance context um, and by this, we mean long-term steady cash flows uh, from essential infrastructure like assets uh, in an SPV structure. Um, these include obviously traditional asset classes like renewable energy, gas plants, midstream oil and gas pipeline assets and so forth. But increasingly digital infrastructure assets as well, uh, such as telecom networks, data centers, um, et cetera, uh, which you know, as investors are obviously getting increasingly viewing these um, as infrastructure assets as well. Um, and we have noticed a significant increase in investor, investor activity uh, in this area over the past few years. As the asset class which is predicated on providing you know, the basis for technology services, it's not a surprise that it will be affected uh, by technical advances. Uh, in our assessment of rating cases for this asset class, we do look to try to analyze how resilient uh, the class is to advances in technology and AI certainly represents uh, something of these lines. So let's just set the stage. Um, I think you would have to be been living under a rock uh, pretty much and uh, not to be aware of uh, ChatGPT, uh, which was soft launched in November 2022, um, kind of under the radar at first, but then very quickly going viral as it were uh, to a very sensational reception um, since particularly, I guess, early January or February of this year. Um, I don't know if anyone here has had the opportunity to try it out. I have, and it actually is really quite impressive. What it certainly has done also is spurred a raft of competing announcements from other technology companies, um, a sort of AI arms race, if you will, uh, to try to integrate these capabilities into their service offerings. And in doing so, has spurred some serious discussion among scientists, technologists, policymakers, and politicians about the impact of AI on society. And so, it really, has done is bring this technology potential into the forefront um, of public imagination and discourse. And directly relevant to us in the financial services industry, it's also spawned some very significant hype uh, around the big boost uh, that this would have on technology and IT industry in general, and specifically semiconductor companies like NVIDIA, which make the processors which enable AI. Um, so we can see, for instance, that NVIDIA stock has climbed almost 200% uh, since the beginning of January, and is largely based on its very kind of leading edge um, <coughs> advantage um, in AI chips. And we'll get to this a little bit later in the presentation as well. What's been less obvious, we think, um, but equally as impactful is the fact that other sectors, such as digital infrastructure, also stand to benefit significantly from AI if it continues to advance and deploy like this. Um, but there will be some challenges associated with it. So having set the stage, um, our agenda today will be to cover, first of all, 
uh, the basics of artificial intelligence uh, to get everyone on the same page. Um, certainly, this is not intended to be a technical seminar, but I think that you know to properly evaluate and understand AI's impact uh, on this sector, we should have some knowledge of the basics. Uh, next, we'll cover um, how AI creates evolving demands on digital infrastructure, particularly where it's different than some of the current applications that underpin today's um, deployments. Um, and then from there, we'll go to outline what those implications might be for credit and rating factors uh, that we at DBRS Morningstar apply to arrive at the ratings uh, for digital infrastructure financing. This will probably take around 25 minutes or so uh, to cover the main part of the presentation. Uh, throughout this, do please feel free um, to enter questions near the question part um, of the seminar. I believe everyone should have a uh, kind of input panel for that. Um, I will try to reserve most of the questions for the end, uh, but you know, please feel free to enter them as we go along. So to begin with, um, I think we should probably get everyone's minds kind of in the right place when we talk about what we mean by digital infrastructure. Um, and just to be clear, digital infrastructure kind of refers to the physical infrastructure uh, and facilities such as data centers, wireless cell phone towers, um, fiber conduits, um, which actually support and enable technology and technology services. When we talk about covering digital infrastructure, we don't necessarily mean technology companies, you know, like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, telecom companies and the like. Um, although obviously there will be um, overlap uh, with those sectors. Now technology itself advances pretty rapidly um, and can become obsolete in somewhat short cycles. Um, the infrastructure or the physical infrastructure itself is generally longer term, um, less subject to Kind of like these rapid um, ob obsolescent cycles. Um, DBRS Morningstar rates digital infrastructure under our recently published global methodology for rating digital infrastructure. Um, and underlying that, we assume or we kind of expect that uh, the credit quality of debt rating depends on stability and long term nature of these cash flows that are generated by these access. The coming wave of artificial intelligence adoption has the potential, as we said, to drive very strong demand for digital infrastructure. But the nature of the computing workload does differ from current applications, um, and therefore some adaptability will be required in order to meet these revised needs um, and maintain essentially the long-term competitiveness and kind of relevancy that we expect um, of well-rated uh, digital infrastructure assets. A brief timeline um, of artificial intelligence development, I think that would be very useful um, in understanding uh, the context of where we stand now. Um, if you haven't been following the technology sector closely, you might be forgiven uh, for thinking that AI really started with ChatGPT's launch. Uh, but in fact, uh, as you look at this timeline here, AI and its predecessors go well back, uh, well before 1980. Um, and there have been actually a number of fits and starts as the technology and techniques um, have been developed and refined over time. Um, included in that um, is something typical of technology development, which is uh, periods of significant low and AI winter, uh, so to speak, particularly in the 1990s, um, as some of the initial kind of hopes and aspirations uh, that were initially developed in the 1980s um, kind of failed to live up to the hype and people's attention kind of drifted off to other things. Um, some people may remember uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the late 1990s, actually, I think it was IBM Deep Blue made some headlines by beating the world chess champion. Um, headlines were made again um, in the early to mid 2010s uh, when IBM Watson defeated a number of Jeopardy champions. Um, and so you know, the kind of waves that AI um, has come through I mean, is not necessarily new. Um, but really, you know, as it has developed um, a couple of key items or things that have happened in the past 15 years or so that have really brought the technology, I guess, to a forefront of maturity. Uh, first among these would be the transition from rules-based to expert systems, rules-based expert systems, sorry, um, to data-driven learning models kind of in the early 2000s. Uh, really kind of a transition from 
you know, a set of complicated rules, if then, if then uh, type of analysis uh, to learning models and AI models, which attempt to reflect more uh, what, how the human mind thinks. Um, it's also noteworthy, I think, um, that starting in the early 2010s, corporate developed deployment of specific AI applications for, you know, very specific corporate um, means uh, really begins to gain traction. And as we move towards the early 2020s, um, startups and venture funded companies begin kind of board development of AI applications for a number of uses. Um, these are all very specific. They don't capture the public imagination in the same way uh, that ChatGPT does. Um, but nevertheless, um, there have been significant advances. Um, and in fact, the capability is already being deployed in many applications. Um, and so, you know, when we get to this stage here, the question will be, you know, ChatGPT is obviously taking up news. Is it hype? Um, or are we kind of really entering an era where um, the, the, the technology and deployments become more mature? Um, that is a question for us analysts, obviously, but I think that there's some evidence that, you know, this time it is for real, so to speak. A quick touch also on how artificial intelligence works. Uh, because this actually does drive the different uh, usage patterns uh, that we referred to um, in previous slides. Again, not meant to be a technical seminar, um, but it does kind of outline several basics, I guess. Um, in essence, AI works by exposing a purpose-built you know, computer model to very large sets of relevant data, and then allows this model to naturally and organically discover and build associations and patterns in this data. Um, and so, for example, you know, based on a large data set um, of actual text, um, a language learning AI one might learn to associate the word bark uh, with the word tree uh, because of the high occurrence of these two words together. Um, and the further step then, when it looks at additional actual text, it may be able to distinguish this from another association between bark and dog, um, you know, using the fact that animal the high correlation was one pattern while the word leaf or leaves you know often appears with the other so the idea here is that um the model or the ai system learns organically without having it having a prescriptive uh set of uh set of rules which was how ai had been done previously um its power kind of comes from this area but it doesn't mean that a large amount of data is required in order to get um, the AI model properly trained. So this phase is actually called the training phase. Um, and it is kind of done in order to teach, you know, the AI model <laughs> about its domain. Um, once you have trained the model, um, you can then present um, the AI model with new information, releasing the wild, so to speak, actual um, information. Um, and it will be able to react to that um, and based on the patterns that it has learned, uh, infer certain conclusions and present those conclusions to you. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, in the case of real world applications, they might infer, for instance, or predict the next sequence of words, uh, given the input of an incomplete sentence fragment or a question uh, based on probabilities of these other words associated with those sentence fragments that it has observed and learned uh, in the training phase. So having an idea now of, I guess, how it's, how AI works, um, let's take a look at the evolving demands that it places on digital infrastructure. First off, AI, as we've said, drives demand for computing power. An enormous amount of computing power is required um, in order to properly train uh, the model. Um, and then once it has been trained, also to kind of deploy it in the world and operationalize it. AI computations for both training and inference um, phase, the second phase, are highly intensive. Uh, they do require specialized high-end semiconductors uh, known as graphical processing units uh, or GPUs, which interestingly enough, 
uh, were actually designed initially to process high-speed graphics uh, for applications like high-end computing, uh, high-end gaming, sorry. Uh, but it turns out that these calculations are actually very similar in nature to those used for AI training uh, and inference. So as these have become more powerful, um, they also increase in cost. Currently, um, specific kind of processors produced by NVIDIA can cost up to $10,000 per unit or more. Um, as I said, NVIDIA is the most biggest supplier of these, um, and hence their stock price chart earlier. But other suppliers are also active in the market, uh, and firms like Google um, are actually also trying to make their own designs. The operative word, I guess, for the computing power and number of uh, processors which may be required is huge or ginormous. Um, <clears throat> you know, there have been estimates made um, by third parties of exactly how much processing power has been required um, just to, you know, integrate or to deploy ChatGPT. Um, and independent analysis has estimated this at somewat north of 25 to 30,000 GPUs kind of clustered, say, in two, say, 3,000, 3,500 to 4,000 servers um, just to train uh, and deploy ChatGPT in its limited um, kind of beta release. The equivalent capex of this um, is up to 225 million, so it's quite a large amount. Um, <coughs> estimates have been made that if you were to take ChatGPT's capabilities, for instance, and fully integrate it into a widely deployed um, application such as Google Search, upwards of 40 million GPUs um, at some 600,000 servers may be required, which is the equivalent capex of $100 billion. And for context, you know, a very, very high-end uh, data center uh, probably runs a total of five to $8 billion uh, in, uh, in total capital cost. Um, so you can imagine what this means uh, in terms of the equivalent capex um, if you really want to deploy um, kind of AI in the real world applications. Now, this seemingly is extreme, uh, but the expectation that optimization of AI models, uh, better training and inference techniques, um, as well as the increasing processing power um, should moderate these requirements. So we're not saying that you're going to be spending or that the world will require $100 billion to deploy search uh, AI into search, but it gives the idea of the scale and magnitude of computing power required. Even if you're not Google uh, or Microsoft and building out these data centers um, for AI, if you are an application developer for AI, for instance, or one of the many startups um, that have been trying to apply artificial intelligence techniques um, to their specific application domain, this will cost you a lot of money. Um, you know, the high capex costs uh, translates to pretty high operations costs just for AI applications. It's notable that both, you know, the hyperscale of the really big um, IT firms, as well as smaller co data center co-location operators, already do offer AI services to customer ten and their tenants. Um, but the cost is quite high. The initial training cost um, for a startup who's trying to kind of develop an AI model could be between five to ten million dollars just to train. Um, the ongoing inference operating costs, so once you kind of release it um, for service, could be forty million dollars uh, a month or more. Um, and to keep in mind also that just because you've trained uh, the AI model once doesn't mean it doesn't need to go through regular retraining in order to keep it up to date. Um, you know, at five to ten million dollars uh, each time you train, it's quite a burden. Uh, on many AI uh, companies, uh, particularly their startups, financed by venture capital or large technology firms, it is you know quite a uh, quite a bite out of their budget. Um, and so you know it behooves the entire industry to find ways to uh, reduce these costs, but also kind of indicates a kind of impact um, that AI has the potential to have on these digital infrastructure. AI's processing requirements that we touched on previously um, place different demands on digital infrastructure than current cloud computing. So right now you have, you know, um, a number of data centers, a uh, number of cell towers, et cetera, 
that would support current applications. These are pretty capital intensive as they are. Um, but the processing and the calculations um, that AI does and the use pivoting patterns are somewhat different uh, than these current applications. And that kind of places different demands on digital infrastructure. Um, an outline of some of these is in this table here. I won't go into all of them. Um, but a uh, couple of key ones um, is first and foremost, power consumption and heat production. Uh, we kind of reference how much computing power AI really requires. Um, and these processors consume a lot of power. Um, accordingly, they produce more heat uh, than conventional applications. Uh, for those of you, you know, who've worked with data center financings before, um, you know that uh, environmental control cooling systems is a very important part of a data center and its performance specifications. Uh, and clearly, when you have uh, a large number of processes which generate significant heat, data centers will require larger electrical systems um, and more powerful environmental control designs in order to address these, uh, these requirements. Additionally, uh, the computing workload uh, may change, um, driven by the fact that uh, you do have a lot of processing required for AI, um, and that introduces latency, meaning delays um, between requests to the system uh, and your response back. So, you know, if you've kind of played with ChatGPT, you know that there can be some delay between when you're asking the question and when it responds. Part of that is because it's thinking, but another part of it is because there is some lag between where the network gets your request and the actual location of the processing um, of the AI request. Um, and as a result of that, as many AI applications get, um, get pushed out uh, into real world, um, it's going to drive a need for functionality for AI um, to come out from just the central big, big data center locations um, that we have right now um, into more local, uh, edge facilities as they are known closer to the uh, to the end user. This is also important, you know, if you have AI applications eventually for such things as self-driving cars, clearly response time and latency is very important. Um, edge data centers, um, and kind of pushing out this functionality closer to the end user is not new, um, but again, the scale required by AI uh, could be, you know, quite larger uh, than what is currently uh, currently used. And finally, an interesting uh, usage pattern between AI training and AI operations um, is emerging uh, in that training an AI model is generally not as reliant on high-speed connectivity with the outside world um, and is potentially more resilient to short periods of unavailability. Now, again, for those of you who work with digital infrastructure, you know that Availability, redundancy, and high-speed networking are key drivers um, of uh, of these of digital infrastructure and data centers in particular. Um, <clears throat> and the fact that the training portion of the AI data model is not as reliant on these traditional important factors does mean there's some opportunities, perhaps, um, for cost reduction and optimization and kind of redesign um, of how an AI data center might look like if it was designed specifically for training purposes. So what does this mean uh, for credit and rating driver implications uh, for the uh, for digital infrastructure? Again, um, as we've said, um, you know, data centers we just got to review what drives credit quality and investment grade ratings uh, in the digital infrastructure class. Um, you know, looking at it from the point of view of project finance or digital infrastructure methodology, um, these assets are often owned uh, by infrastructure asset managers uh, and leased to off takers, usually technology companies, under long term 30 year type contracts with regular optional renewal points um, at which both the lessor or the tenant can choose to terminate the lease. Um, the debt term financing for this, however, often spans multiple lease renewal points. And so this potentially introduces a revenue risk um, in that if your tenant, you know, your technology company decides uh, not to renew the lease, they don't think they need the data center or they don't think they need 
um, a set of telecom towers anymore. Um, you know, <coughs> you're stuck with an asset uh, that you need to go and find another uh, replacement tenant for. Um, the way that this risk is mitigated um, and the way that, um, you know, we at the rating agency get comfortable uh, with uh, the credit quality um, of this type of asset is that we generally look for um, aspects that kind of lend stability and the very long-term nature um, of the cash flows, which means that over a significant period of time, over several technology cycles, for instance, uh, your, your technology or your digital infrastructure asset has to remain relevant and essential. We generally feel that this is the case um, for data centers and uh, cell phone towers and fiber conduits, et cetera. Um, but, you know, inherently, um, because the underlying assumption is that the leases have a very high probability of being renewed, any factor that could affect the stickiness, so to speak, um, of this asset um, and of the lease could affect the rating uh, if it is sufficiently severe. So what do we think are some of the rating impacts uh, on data centers? Um, again, because the nature of the computing workload that AI represents um, is so different uh, from applications to date, this obviously kind of filters down uh, to data center design requirements and operations and affects how these are built and where they are located. Specifically, um, you know, as we mentioned in a couple of previous slides, um, the different infrastructure, the different cooling requirements um, of data centers, uh, the fact that you use a lot more heat and a lot more power, um, the fact that also even the design and the layout of the racks um, inside a data center um, <coughs> can be optimized uh, for AI purposes means that you're increasingly likely to see uh, purpose-built designs uh, specific to AI um, in the future uh, for data centers. In particular, the higher cooling demands drives higher investment costs. Um, previous data centers have been you know, air-cooled um, and that has been sufficient, um, but now we're looking at requirements to kind of bring liquid cooling uh, kind of more directly to the rack and directly to the data centers, the servers in the data centers. Um, and this is you know, a pretty fundamental change and your design has to be adopt that, uh, uh, has to adapt to that appropriately um, DBS Morningstar here, we've already seen uh, some interest in financings uh, and ratings for data centers which are designed specifically for um, AI applications. These higher capital costs um, and dependency on utilities and inter telecom interconnect. Um, also, kind of, again, you expect to see higher capital costs on a per megawatt uh, basis. That's kind of like the power unit. Um, of how <coughs> how data centers are measured, um, we have seen in this in these ratings a differential of up to thirty to fifty percent higher cost uh, than than in the past, um, because you're also let me say dependent on uh, have more ex exacting requirements uh, for power um, as well as additional interconnect and connectivity requirements. This gives greater dependencies on external parties, such as utilities, you know, to be able to build substations and create the infrastructure um, required for these data set, newer data centers. Um, and for construction related financings or construction related ratings, what this means is that there is in increased dependency on external parties. Anytime you have to dependency on external parties, you have increased risk um, and therefore you know, we may look to see uh, more stringent security uh, and credit enhancements uh, during the construction period in the form of, you know, higher levels of credit, more reserves, more budget buffers uh, required to offset perceived higher construction risk. And this also applies, you know, because the technology that you are deploying uh, on the environmental systems is relatively new. Uh, we need to see, you know, until it's got a proven track record um, that also introduces some risk. And so overall, you know, we would receive somewhat higher construction risk um, and therefore will require more stringent security 
credit enhancements um, in order to be comfortable uh, with this. Similarly, um, secondary locations um, and edge data centers, uh, which are the smaller um, data centers compared to um, <coughs> compared to the big hyperscale ones run by uh, you know the big Google, Microsofts of the world. Um, these may actually increase in credit worthiness, um, as we stated before. Um, you're trying to push out um, functionality um, kind of closer to the user. Um, and therefore they take on a more critical role. The more critical the role that the facility plays, um, the greater the credit worthiness is because it is not as easy um, for a lessor uh, to exit the beast without severely impacting their operations. Now, in the past, locations and prime data center corridors, so you know, there have been um, kind of built up over time um, specific locations. Um, such as Virginia in the U.S., uh, where data centers naturally congregate. Um, and they do that for a reason, because, you know, the technology asset, um, the more data center operators, the more data centers that exist in one location, the more an ecosystem of supporting services is built. Um, and so it's easier uh, for, you know, utilities for instance, to justify new investments um, in increased power substations, and things of that nature because you know you have um, an installed base of customers there to take it. Um, so, you know, your ex a location um, historically has been very important and associated with higher credit quality. Um, but because again, the unique requirements of AI training that we touched on and the need to push computing functions close to the end user may result in these secondary locations now, uh, which traditionally have not, uh, which we would have looked at as perhaps less credit worthy, um, they may increase in credit worthiness um, and therefore, you know, you're going to get higher ratings uh, in the same location. Um, if, you know, <clears throat> we see that um, AI deployments uh, really do require this functionality to be pushed out. Um, a key factor um, that we look at is the competitiveness of existing centers um, and how they might change over time. Um, again, we've touched on the fact that uh, AI uh, requires a significant um, new requirements um, into the physical configuration, um, et cetera. Um, and existing facilities, while they are able to support AI, because they currently do, to be honest, um, <laughs> you know, they're not optimal for this purpose. Um, and over time, they may have to be upgraded or reconfigured to support on the increasing deployment of AI. Now, not all existing facilities can be upgraded in a cost-effective or optimal manner. Uh, the question is, you know, if they cannot be, um, will they find their use cases limited over time to, you know, the more traditional um, <coughs> applications? And will that attract, you know, increased correspondingly lower rents um, or higher probability of going off lease? Uh, and if it does say that, then the follow-on effect will be a lower credit quality. It doesn't mean that you're left with a stranded asset uh, if your facility is not capable um, of optimally supporting AI, but it does take away you know, a large uh, use case um, and therefore erodes away um, at the competitiveness. Um, so this is something that you know, will have to be watched over time. Um, <clears throat> You know, you can see this, I guess, as a specific instance of general technical obsolescence, uh, which, you know, DBS Morningstar, we do take into account uh, when doing our data center uh, credit ratings. Uh, we've historically imposed uh, fairly regular and significant upgrade costs uh, through the term of the debt um, in our data center ratings, as we assume the data center will need to do that in order to remain competitive and relevant. Um, I guess the question here is that the scale of that required um, to support AI um, is something that we need to be looked at over time. This actually brings us to another uh, topic, which is you know the optimal trade-off of upgrades to data centers uh, versus new facilities. Um, at some point, you know, <laughs> is it better to upgrade an older facility to a configuration which is just short of optimal, um, or is it 
a uh, is it a uh, you know better to just kind of invest in the upfront um, new data center? Uh, this is a question I think that the industry is beginning to grapple with. Um, it will be come. It could become a consideration uh, when renewing leases, um, kind of in the future. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but it definitely will be something that will be thought of. Um, I guess going forward, a couple of interesting, you know, um, <coughs> possibilities raised by current data center industry participants um, may include kind of splitting off your data center and new designs. Uh, or upgrades such that you have one particular facility dedicated to more traditional uses, one facility or half a facility, I guess, dedicated to um, to AI provisions. Um, and so that might be something that will be looked at and could become, uh, could become uh, something that the industry does. But in any case, you know, existing centers will face this changing environment um, and, and its rating kind of credit quality rating case, assumptions will have to be looked at accordingly. That's a rating impact on data centers. Um, telecom towers actually um, are another very uh, key part of digital infrastructure that we rate. Um, with respect to telecom towers, uh, we don't envision that AI will directly affect the credit quality um, of telecom tower debt financings. Um, <clears throat> the use cases, I guess, the differential use cases is not as uh, not as noticeable um, as they are for data centers. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, what it could do um, is affect or reinforce, sorry, already existing trends and provide support to rating assumptions related to this asset class. Now, as we mentioned before. Real time uh, AI applications um, depend, will depend um, on connectivity, um, both in terms of accessing the data um, to perform its inference calculations, um, as well as kind of getting queries and requests from end users. Um, and we feel that, you know, the real time wireless data connectivity um, that provides many of these um, connections. Uh, could drive demand uh, for capacity and tower densification. Tower codes are generally uh, rated, again, on their essentiality um, because wireless telecom companies need um, towers in order to provide service. But even then, there's a bit of a split uh, between the purpose of the towers um, in the network um, in that Newer technologies for wireless communications use higher frequencies, uh, higher frequencies have a shorter broadcast range. Um, and so to provide, when you kind of upgrade from 4G, which has to 5G, which are currently deploy, and potentially up to 6G in the future, um, you would need more towers just to cover physically the same amount of area um, that one tower could have done in the past. Again, it's because higher frequencies travel a shorter distance. Um, and so <clears throat> towers which are designed or which are placed for coverage purposes um, are very essential. Whereas towers that you then infill, so to speak, so once you reach, reach a certain amount of coverage on uh, a physical area, um, then you start looking at usage patterns. The more people who use wireless data, the more people who use um, the telecom network, um, the more congested you know, that area becomes. And that's where you need to start adding more towers, not for coverage purposes, but for capacity to handle the new demand. <clears throat> towers which are added for capacity purposes are obviously kind of more subject to market risk because if people don't take up your service um, as much as you think they will, um, then <clears throat> um, you don't need as many. Um, most of the tower code financing that we have seen um, incorporate some element um, of capacity expansion. Um, in general, we're kind of comfortable with those assumptions, but it is worth noting that 5G so far has really kind of failed to deliver um, to date um, on the type of uh, type of increase in usage um, that was expected. That's not to say we ever get there, um, but it's, you know, has been somewhat disappointing, I guess, uh, for many telecom carriers. 
Um, and the fact that, you know, you're now the additional use case in AI um, could help, you know, reinforce or begin to strengthen uh, that capacity argument uh, again. The other thing um, that could be impacting telecom tower companies is that there's already a trend uh, for tower calls to start co-locating small data centers alongside their towers. And this is a recognition of the fact that um, locating processing power very close to uh, the communication the networking um, location uh, does provide optimal benefits. Um, and this trend, again, could be accelerated and reinforced uh, by AI, uh, where there is actually a very specific need uh, to locate uh, processing power closer to end users. Um, so we could see that in the future for tower poles um, and fewer tower future, sorry, uh, tower infrastructure ratings may need to blend both tower um, and data center rating elements. But again, these are more, I guess, indirect um, impacts uh, on telecom tower financings. Uh, AI specifically, you know, its usage pattern we don't think is, you know, sufficiently different than it is right now to really drive credit quality upwards or downwards uh, either way. So with that, um, this, you know, that's uh, the overview, I guess, of how we view um, the impact of AI uh, on data, on digital infrastructure. If we look ahead, you know, really, the success and novelty of ChatGPT has captured public attention, spurred a lot of public discussion, and has kind of provided a big impetus um, for many uh, technology companies to move ahead with their plans. Uh, as we said before, digital infrastructure assets do stand to see significant benefit uh, from widespread AI adoption, largely due to the processing power required, but will need to kind of grapple with the changing landscape um, that could affect the relevancy of existing facilities and rating factors as a whole. The fact is that many of the things that we've been talking about today really depend on how much or how fast um, the new trends in data in AI deployment take. They will take some time to play out. Um, as you know, uh, there is already a lot of societal discussion about this. Um, we know that very recently, um, a number of AI scientists and technologists have actually signed a petition uh, requesting a pause in AI development while society kind of grapples uh, with some of these questions. Um, interestingly enough, I don't know if you saw, but uh, Google's chief AI uh, scientist resigned uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, again, with a kind of warning of let's, you know, take a pause on this and really think about what we're doing. But on the other hand, the benefits of some incremental AI applications to business operations, to efficiency is you know, undeniable. Um, and so you're gonna have this tension, um, how that tension plays out, um, how you know, people look at a societal ethical implications, uh, fake news <laughs> uh, that has been sort of in the uh, discussion topic about what ChatGPT could generate uh, and things of that nature will really impact in addition to technology trends and financing trends, the societal trends will also be very important uh, in how AI, uh, the pace of AI deployments. Um, and so these are things that also will have to be looked at, you know, not just um, the use cases, uh, the, <laughs> the rating factors uh, in really determining uh, what we think the impact of AI will be uh, on, on digital infrastructure. So with that, uh, I think we've come to the end of the, of the presentation part. Uh, we've actually gone a little bit over. Uh, I thought that this would be around 30 minutes, but we're actually getting closer to 45. Uh, but very happy to take questions now from uh, from people and the audience. Okay, so I have one question here. Um, it is, uh, let's see, there has been talk um, about a wholesale change in data center design uh, leading to a very significant disruption. Um, what do 
we as DBRS think about that. Um, <clears throat> I think that, yeah, there has been, as we've kind of mentioned in the, uh, in the presentation, uh, some more extremely, as I guess you could call it, um, of the impact uh, to data centers requiring a wholesale design, uh, requiring, um, you know, in, in essence, in obsolescence um, of the current set of data center facilities. Um, I think it's a bit too early to say that, um, again, for a number of reasons. As we said, the pace of AI deployment uh, will be uh, will be determined uh, by factors, you know, that don't just include finance um, and technology. Um, the other thing worth noting, I think, um, is that, you know, AI is actually currently already um, supported uh, by many IT companies, uh, only not to the scale um, that is potentially envisioned. Um, and so, you know, there will always be coexisting um, of the current applications uh, with, uh, with new AI. Um, and so don't necessarily see, see a wholesale replacement of existing facilities, uh, besides which the existing use cases, cloud computing, streaming video, storage, things of that nature, are obviously gonna continue, they're not gonna go away. Um, <clears throat> so you will always need data centers which are kind of designed for that purpose. Um, and so we don't necessarily see that, you know, there'll be a wholesale change um, in, in data center design, um, but again, more of a uh, view to, um, <clears throat> you know, gradual technology improvements or gradual technology changes um, that will lead over time to uh, impacts on the rating factors. Um, if, you know, if, if your facility is not capable of adapting to this. I guess another question here is that, uh, do we see that there's more of an immediate impact? Um, you did reference um, <coughs> facilities that you have seen, um, which already uh, begin to, which already have, um, <coughs> sorry, it's <laughs> clear here, which are, which are already purpose designed for AI. Um, and so will there be kind of immediate impacts um, and I think the question, the answer there um, is that um, I think, you know, Meta has already kind of publicly stated that uh, they are pausing developments on some data centers um, in order to reconfigure for um, AI. Um, but again, I think we would see that more of a gradual um, development as opposed to very immediate um, development. Um, so. I think that we were looking at these trends that we talked about here more on a long-term basis. Um, don't think that you know your data centers uh, and tower calls you know, will go obsolete immediately. Um, but these are definitely trends that you need to watch out for um, over time. Okay, I think that, uh, you know, I think that this will be the end. I don't see any more questions coming in, but please uh, feel free again to send us questions uh, after the webinar is over, uh, if you do have them. Uh, I thank you very much um, for, uh, for attending. Uh, hope that everyone found something interesting about this. Uh, and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.